watching maybe for the first time or those of you who watch every Sunday, we are glad to have you with us and welcome to this service of worship. Let us pray. O oh God who created us in love, O oh God who redeemed this world in love, O oh Holy Spirit who moves this world toward its God-appointed end, amen. call to confession. Being human, we never find it easy to ask for forgiveness, but as God's children called to live in relationship with one another, we know we must speak of how we have hurt others so we might be forgiven and restored to new life. Please join me as we pray to God, saying, Merciful God, you have called us to a journey with you. Forgive us, we would rather journey on roads of our own making. You have called us to a journey on paths that Jesus has trod and laid for us to follow. Forgive us. We would rather take the easier way to go. You have called us to set our minds and hearts toward service and obedience. Forgive us. We have many other things to do. Lord, Lead us straight onto the journey of your purposes for us and the world you are making. In Jesus' name, amen. And now a moment of silent personal reflection. Amen. This is the good news that comes from God. I will hear your prayers. I will answer with hope and peace. I will deliver you from your sins. God, God has, has covered, covered us, us with, with grace. grace. Under, Under God's, God's hope, we, we will find shelter. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we hear your word today, May it take root in each of us so that we produce lives of grace and justice as you bid us to do. Amen. The first scripture reading is Psalm uh, chapter 9, verses 13 through 20. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See what I suffer from those who hate me. You are the one who lifts me up from the gates of death so that I may recount all your praises. And in the gates of the daughter of Zion, rejoice in your deliverance. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net that they hide has their own foot caught, been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall depart to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. Rise up, O Lord, do not let mortals prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are only hum human. A 
Our sermon text this morning is made up of two passages. One is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the uncircumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompany me, and we entered the man's house. Our second passage is from John 13, verses 34 to 35. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, push us out beyond our comfort zones. Help us to question more deeply the standards of the world, even our own religious actions so that we can adopt your standard of living and loving. Amen. Just how far should love go? That's the quandary both Acts and John present to us this morning. Just how far should Christian love extend? Love. We preach about it, sing about it, dream about it, but as we all know, the hardest part about love is practicing it. Loving those with whom we agree or are partial to or find delightful is the easiest thing in the world. Loving all the rest of the folks we come in contact with is a much more challenging proposition. Perhaps loving the stranger or the one we deem most abhorrent is the hardest of all. One of the legends about St. Francis of Assisi began appearing in the 13th century. You find it in many forms because it probably came from a compilation of events in his life. But the writers weren't really trying to give a completely historical account. They were attempting to tell their interpretation of the meaning of his life and ministry. The story goes that St. Francis, as a young man, was terrified of lepers. He used to run away from them at the mere tinkling of the bell they were forced to wear as they walked down the streets. And Francis wasn't alone. Everyone was frightened of lepers. And who can blame them? To 
To let them walk about without a bell would have meant the infection of a whole community. They were right, as far as human logic goes. But tragically, the disease and the bell defined the lepers. They were no longer seen as humans, but as walking infections, outcasts. And one day, shortly after Francis' conversion, he was out riding his horse. He heard the bell that announced the coming of a leper, and he did what he normally did. He turned around and started to ride away. Only this time, something stopped him. It told him to turn back. He was terrified and revolted. No, he said to himself, I will not. I hate lepers. But whatever he heard kept niggling at him. He turned his horse around and he went back. He dismounted. The leper reached out to him and Francis gave him money and also a kiss. And then mounted his horse and rode away. But as he did so, he looked back at the leper and he saw nothing. Although the road ran through a wild field obstructed by anything, Francis could not see the leper anywhere. Now this legend implies that it was Christ himself who came in the form of a leper. So that through this encounter, Francis found that the object of his fear and disdain was a human being made in the image of God. And from this realization came his lifelong ministry to lepers. If this is Christian love, then it's a terrifyingly high bar isn't it? And I believe I'm not alone in saying this high bar is a challenge that you and I do struggle with as Christians, especially now when our country is increasingly polarized around so many issues, when fear and disdain of others runs high, and questions about worthiness and inclusiveness, and that permits the whole, permeates the whole political spectrum. John 13 tells us something about living as a community in times like this. In that crucible moment before Jesus, or Judas' betrayal of Jesus and Peter's denial, when Jesus was saying goodbye to his friends, knowing that this tight little group of disciples was about to be torn apart, by the events to come. He gave them a command about love. Now he could have said, go out into the streets and march for 30 minutes for the outcasts of the world. Or close yourself in your study and pray about how much you love me and, and your own personal salvation. Instead, he offered this challenge. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you see what he did there? He was letting them know that he, they could never love strangers with his kind of love and could never kiss the leper clean until they learned how to love each other that way first. He gave them a model. And he left it up to them and to us to apply this kind of love in all the various contexts and pathways of our daily lives. 
Now, I believe we in the church do a fairly decent job of loving each other. We organize ourselves to take food to the sick, visit the lonely, comfort the afflicted. We sometimes even practice self-denial and self-sacrifice as we beam Jesus' love toward the people we know. Yet on the other hand, it's that very laser beam love church folks have for each other which often makes the church like a wall that many outsiders never manage to get over into full acceptance and welcome, no matter how hard they try. Oh, we may think we're accepting everyone, yet the congregational on undertone, the subtle body language that turns away instead of turning toward, the tight little cliques circling up together with no space for a stranger to enter, says something else. And we often don't even realize what we're doing. So how can we then do the tougher job of loving those people who are out on the margins, who will never enter the church doors, and whose lives or values or beliefs may be entirely different from our own. I find the question of loving people on the margins to be the most challenging one in my life right now. In these days, when some folks wear hatred and rage so proudly on their sleeves. And if my love goes no further than a feeling or an emotion or the people I like and the ones who look most like me, or if it never takes into account my denial of the secret unexam unexamined prejudice and exclusion lurking inside me, then I must surely fall short of the love of Christ. Peter abruptly learned this when a dream made him consider the limits he was putting on his own love, as we learned in Acts 11 this morning. The living Lord showed Peter all the things Peter hated most, all that he considered profane, unworthy, on a large sheet come down from heaven. And then he said to Peter, what God has made clean, you must not profane. Peter's faith in his own ability to determine what belonged in his personal hierarchy and what did not took a big hit. Belonging is one of the most fundamental needs of human beings. A psychologist once put it this way, inclusive kingdom of God, in the other hand. Yet we're afraid to talk publicly or even among ourselves about the gap between our own prejudice and the kingdom of God. So we sing hymns about social justice. Certain individuals participate in marches and demonstrations. We offer charity. But pretty much the church remains silent about the core issues surrounding poverty and racism and gender. Or the ramifications of Presbyterians, Presbyterians saying, as we do in the preamble to our Book of Order, that the church is the visible demonstration of God's kingdom on earth. How far will we go in allowing that visible demonstration to show? I recently read a book about the Tulsa Massacre. 
It's called The Groundbreaking, and it's by a University of Michigan professor, Scott Ellsworth, a former Tolson who has been at the forefront of discovering the truth of what occurred on June 1, 1921, when a large mob of white people headed down the Black Wall Street with guns, torches, and cans of gasoline. Now, I'm personally interested in this story because I lived a good part of my adult life in Tulsa. And I never, ever heard of this. I grew up in Oklahoma. I never, ever learned it in Oklahoma history. And amazingly, this incident disappeared from collective memory from history books, even from polite conversation. Truly a conspiracy of silence. Not long before I moved away from there in 1990, I did come across an article hidden away on the back pages of the Tulsa world. The article called the incident a race riot. The assumption being, of course, that the black people rioted. The truth was, a mob of white people rioted and murdered and pillaged. This marks the only time Americans were ever attacked with bombs from airplanes by other Americans on their own soil. Countless black men, women, and children lost their livelihood and many their lives and their mass graves remain unmarked and mostly unrevealed even today. And you need to understand, Tulsa was not a Wild West city in 1921, but a sophisticated and rich city with oil money and mansions and elegant tall steeple churches. The book calls up locations with which I'm quite familiar, and it names people, some of whose descendants I knew well. And it names First Presbyterian Church downtown, where I was on staff for 12 years. That church's role in these events falls somewhere in a gray area between heroically living out the gospel and falling far short. On the evening prior to the massacre, an angry mob stood outside the county courthouse demanding a victim for lynching. Dr. Charles Kerr, the distinguished pastor of that prestigious church, courageously walked into the middle of that boiling cauldron, attempted to bring calm, urging people to go home. They eventually did, but returned the next day with hundreds of reinforcements who rampaged their way through the black community without mercy. First Presbyterian's written history reflects that at the end of the day's massacre, church members fed and housed homeless survivors of the violence in the church basement. A good thing, a charitable thing, a Christian response, something of which to feel proud. But what the church history did not reveal was the shocking notice First Presbyterian placed in one of the city newspapers the next Saturday. It informed First Presbyterian's members and anyone else who might want to attend on Sunday that even though all those black folks had been housed in the basement for a while, they were now gone and the building completely fumigated. Now, I don't imagine that First Tulsa would ever react like that today any more than this church would. For one thing, today we all know how to be much more sophisticated and subtle with our prejudice and fear. It's a cautionary tale, 
about how easy it is to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Without love behind what we do, our best efforts can actually harm others. So I leave you with that story and the legend of St. Francis and these questions for further spiritual reflection on your part. What would the Christian church look like today if it became the visible demonstration of God's love in our troubled society. Just how far would our love have to go? Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, in these quiet moments, we do lift our eyes to you. For we know that this world is so often more than we can handle by ourselves. Our hopes ebb and flow. Tomorrow carries with it uncertainty. There are challenges that take all we have in us, and then some. And when the night is upon us, and the dawn has not yet come, your face is what we long to see in the darkness. So we each individually take our concerns in our hands and lift them to you, an offering of the deepest part of ourselves, which we entrust to no other. In this moment, Listen to us as we each name our fears, our worries, those things with which we struggle most right now. Take these, O oh God, and grant us peace. We also have prayers of concern for those we know. In this moment, listen to us as we call out their names in the silence of our hearts. Lord, it is easy for, to pray for those we know, but sometimes we find it difficult to include those we don't know. Even when you call everyone and everything holy. So hear us now and help us to pray from the heart for the people and situations that seem far from our everyday lives and experience. Let us pray. Lord, what you call holy, help us not to call profane. May we learn to look at the world as the place where you abide, your holy kingdom. Help us to learn how to examine our own prejudice, our own propensity to demonize people whom we do not understand, our own Pharisaic viewpoints, so that in this world of strife, we will become peacemakers as Jesus taught. And in his name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now have a moment for stewardship. Excuse me. I was asked to follow up on Doris's perfect talk last week. I'm to speak about the reality stewardship faces here at PPC. I will address that reality, but first wanted to ask, why are we here? Why do we gather every Sunday to worship, sing, and pray? The reason is our mission. Our website states that, quote, mission is the heart of People's Presbyterian Church. We seek to serve our neighbors, both in Milan and around the world, in any one way we can, unquote. I must expand on that. Last year, stewardship was asked to read, Not Your Parents' Offering Plate by J. Cliff Christopher, a noted authority on church stewardship issues. He stresses that as a church, our mission is to bring persons into a relationship with God through knowledge and faith in Christ. That is why we are here and seek to serve Christ and others. How do we accomplish this sacred mission? It is through our monetary gifts in support of this mission. We need to think about stewardship in the context of our mission, not as line items in a budget. Budgets have their place for accounting and planning and all that, and we create one each year. They're available in the office, or just contact me if you'd like a copy. Rest assured that your session has been diligent in seeking that your gifts are used wisely in support of our Christian mission of faith, worship, outreach, and service. We need to thank God for the legacy left to us by the pastors, church leaders, and dedicated servants who have gone before. I wanted to emphasize this legacy as we tend to take it for granted. We must take care to protect and preserve PPC's legacy. It is our sacred duty. Your gifts support our pastor who plans the worship services, leads us in worship, performs marriages, baptisms, funerals, she counsels and comforts us and performs countless other services to our church community and the community at large. I must resign, <clears throat> excuse me, remind those who are with us via streaming as well as the larger congregation that streaming and other virtual offerings are only available due to the extraordinary efforts of our pastor. COVID-19 forced her to acquire many skills not covered in seminary, which allowed us to work vir worship virtually for the last year or so, and to stream our worship service to you today. We now offer a full range of social media options to further our outreach, which is very important. Social media is how younger folks search for experiences, communicate with each other, and obtain information we must be able to reach out to those younger potential members in a manner that they can relate to. We have a wonderful venue for worship handed down to us by those who have gone before. We enjoy inspiring organ music and hymns, beautiful handbells. Your gifts support our talented organist, handbells, and beautiful music. We have a dedicated staff whose support is critical to our Christian mission. The office prepares the bulletins, the mouse, helps pastor and session committees with a multitude of duties. Our custodian seems, sees to it that our facilities are clean, well organized, and sanitary. We must maintain our facilities so that they continue to be available to
to support our Christian mission and are available for use by community groups as part of our outreach. I must mention the dedicated volunteers who serve and have served on session in and in countless other roles and lead their committees with selfless dedication. Thank you for your service. Many have served in various positions for years, so it's time for others to step up. If asked, please consider serving this church as your time and talents are greatly needed. So, what is the reality of our stewardship here today? In a, wor in a word, it is difficult. We lost Don Harkness in April of 2020. Don's generosity cannot be overestimated as for the last few years, his gifts were close to 20% of our total pledges. Don's annual gift came to us in February each year, which gave us a nice cash, <laughs> cash boost for the rest of the year. We received his final pledge in early 2020 before he passed. Don generously bequeathed a $50,000 gift to us in his will, but it does not replace his annual pledges. Our congregation is aging and shrinking, and we have lost and are losing steadfast pledging members to moving away financial, family, health issues, and the inevitable march of time. Our weekly attendance has declined, as have our weekly collections from those who once attended and gave it the service. The cost of our Christian mission here is about 105,000 a year. For the last couple of years, our annual pledge drive, not including Don, has been between 85 and 90,000. It is imperative that we each do our part to keep the annual pledges in that range. Each member of this church must reflect on how they can support our mission. All members and friends should feel an obligation to pledge and support this church. It is very important that our virtual audience realizes that they must also pledge to continue to enjoy the streaming of our services. We urge those who attend virtually to consider returning in person and share in our church family's fellowship. We also ask that you sign up via our e-giving program. Simply fill out the information on the reverse of your pledge card. Uh, this can be changed at any time. Simply contact the office. The e-giving helps our church and helps you fulfill your pledge. Pledge cards have been mailed and you all should have received a card and letter in the mail. Every friend and member must give serious thought to your pledge gift. Please return the completed card by next Sunday, November 21. We will collect the pledges during the offering or you may return by mail or drop off at the office. We have a rich and long-standing heritage in our community. We have a sacred duty to maintain and further that legacy. We cannot let it wither. Well, the visiting pastor forgot the hymn, so why don't we all stand and sing together?
The willingness to give is a sign of life. The heart that hoards the blessings of God is no longer alive with spiritual power. To live is to give. Let us now be faithful stewards who present their gifts to God. As we offer our gifts to you, gracious God, remind us that we are called to serve in all the places where we will find you, at the entrances to broken neighborhoods, on the heights of despair, in the valleys of injustice, at the crossroads of poverty and hunger. In all those places, we may, may we offer not only our treasures, but our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me now in our affirmation of faith. The life, death, resurrection, and promise coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrongs. 